It's okay. So, uh, today, as uh, Jeremy was explaining, I will talk a bit about the space application of uh, Open Risk and uh, Project Respace uh, system on chip, uh, which I'm working on. So, the talk today is divided in three main parts. First, I will introduce you a bit with the uh, space technologies and space environment and so on. After, some points on specifically open risk and space applications. And then I will introduce you to what, uh, what I call early space. So it means between Carriest Telecom and, uh, and space. So just quickly, Arias Telecom. So that's a company I created uh, last year. So that's an information and communication engineering uh, company, which is specialized in critical environment. So as I was explaining to you, Ries is there to talk about the technology which can be deployed in really diverse environments. So the best um, RES species is a water beer. If you, fan. Usually nobody knows about it, but you sleep with them. They are everywhere, and they are able even to survive in space without any protection. So that's something that we discover. For example, when we have launched uh, some uh, uh, Mars uh, things and so on, there is always a decontamination process, but maybe if we discover life one day, we, will, we won't be sure that it did not came from us <laughs> and our own direction. So the, the goal is to develop technology for dual use, but in the wide sense, so Earth and space, and also civil, governmental, military. And the activities are really uh, are split in two main axes, some services for corporate, so from, so it's, uh, the goal is to help them on the overall information life cycle, so from the beginning to the death. And a second point is research and development of solutions for critical environment. So, space technologies. First, I was wanting just to give a, a rough idea about the different kind of space mission which you can find. Maybe you already heard a bit, but it's always good to the same. So you have basically, uh, here I describe them depending on the orbit, because it changes the environment. So you have the low Earth orbit, these are mainly observation or low latency communication constellation that you can find, which are between, between 200 kilometers and 2,000 kilometers. After you have the medium Earth orbit, between 2,000 kilometers and 35,000 kilometers. Basically, here you find all the GPS, uh, Galileo, GLONASS, all the navigation that are at this orbit. After, there is one specific one which is highly elliptical orbit. So that's uh, an orbit which stays for long, far away, and comes really close from the Earth. So um, there are some advantages that you cannot get with other orbits. And the most famous one that you all know about is the geostationary orbit which is turning at the same uh, speed as the Earth. So 35,786 kilometers. And the last kind of mission is the escape. So when you want to go further, so you need to really go from the gravitation field of the Earth. And for the basic uh, information that you need to know, uh, to describe an, an orbit, typically we use what is called the two-line elements. So it's a standard format where you find a, a few parameters. So basically, six Keplerian elements. So Kepler is the first one who described the, the orbitation and so on. And he did some laws, uh, some basic laws. So you have, with these parameters, you are more or less able to, to know at, with a, a good precision where the satellite is at any time. And if you search, there are some websites where you can find all the two-line elements of the, of the actual uh, spacecraft. So, what, what does it change to make technology for space regarding to typical Earth or typical computer? First, there is a, a big issue with the Sun. There is no magnetic field. Fine, there is a magnetic field, but often you are not uh, protective enough. So the sun is ejecting photons, electrons, protons, and ions. After, there is a background uh, cosmic rays. 
which we don't really know where it is coming from, but there are some particles that come from outer space, so high energy proton and some uh, atomic nuclei. And after, another important uh, topic to know is what is called the Van Allen belt. So I don't know if you heard about it, but due to the Earth's magnetic field, uh, all the particles that come from the sun or the cosmic ray, they stay more or less uh, blocked at two, at two places. And then there is a, a high concentration of, uh, of different kinds of particles. So there are two belts, one lower belt, which is between 1,000 km and 6,000 km, where there is more proton and electron, and an outer belt, where, which is further, where you have more energetic uh, electrons. And the last point also, so nothing really special, but uh, you heard about the space debris. There is today more and more objects orbiting around the Earth, so now you need to take care about uh, collisions with uh, uh, inactive spacecraft or small pieces or meteorites. So, for the topic of today, uh, what has the space environment uh, for effects on the electronics. So there are two main families of disturbance that you can find, that you usually don't find so much in, uh, on Earth, but that you find, but it's so, so small that you don't care about. So for the instantaneous disturbance, so it comes when there is a particle that goes through the chip or through the electronic, and it's creating, so they call it single events effect. And this is due to the uh, ionization of the material. The, the, crystal, fin, the, the structure of the electronics is ionized. And what it gives? So you have mainly upset. So this is not, so you have two kinds of effects, destructive or not. This one is not destructive, so you don't lose the mission, but you are having wrong value. You, you have basically you have a one instead of a zero or zero instead of a one. After there are the latch up, which you might know because it's not specifically, but here it's destructive, so the power supply is shortcut. After there is the burnout. So the burnout is also destructive, is uh, the transistor that uh, itself becomes uh, shortcutted. Another destructive is the gate rupture which is then one piece of the, of the, of the substrate, the dielectric, which is, uh, which is destructive. And then, um, something not really impacting, but that can change your measure. For example, you have, if you have a sensor, you have some transient effect, so you have some noise that is added to your, to your signal. So that's something that you cannot predict, and you cannot do anything instead of uh, protection, and uh, having some system design for the Nancy and so on. So this, you, you live with it. This uh, continuous drift is due to the fact that you stay for 15 years in, the, in space. So you got some, uh, what they call the cumulative dose of radiation. And it's creating also some variation about the, the parameters of the component. So you, this, you need to take the in account when you make your design and should be an S, D-O-S-C. Is that the S? Yeah, thanks. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> in French also, but I thought that in English it would be like that. <laughs> Maybe American. Yeah. Okay. So basically, you have two, two kind of effects. And uh, last point is, what are the main uh, requirements when you develop uh, technology for space? So order, so the most, and order by most important. So first, reliability. Because when it's there, you cannot really do anything else if the, for example, we are, I'm on the telecom part, if you do, cannot send a command or receive data, even if everything works, the mission is dead. So it happens often. So you need to, to make sure that for 15 years it will stay. After, as the lifetime of spacecraft is high, 15 years for your sat satellites, you want to have some flexibility to be able to change the DVBS standard for your satellite uh, TV or this kind of stuff. So you need to have something that you can reprogram and change with the technology evolution. 
third one, the weight, because um, I will not tell a figure, but basically the cost of space technology is totally linked to the weight because the launcher is incredibly, uh, the launch is expensive, so the more weight you have, the more you pay. So you really need to decrease the weight so you can put more and have more functionality. Another one which is the power. You don't have uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, power plants or whatever, so you just have the sun, so you need to, and, and sometimes depending on the orbit, you are for half a day, uh, for some time in the, in the shadow of the Earth, so you cannot even use the solar panel, so you need to really store and really clever use your power. And the last point, having some performance, but that's not the most important. But they want also. So open list for space application. Um, I heard, maybe you heard, and you might know a bit more. Um, so this part, if possible, uh, if you are, have some information to provide, feel free. So me, what I saw, uh, it's in 2012. There was a project Tech and SAP where uh, OpenList was launched. Uh, so it was not a, a long mission, it was just a demonstration. They put it in the ISS and they, and they launch it and it, stay, it stays for maybe six months or one year maximum in, uh, in orbit. Did it work? Fast way away. That's, uh, uh, they say yes, but uh, as I was putting here, few, you, yeah, you so have uh, somewhere Okay, open list was to space, okay, and you go to the manufacturer, which is uh, this company, and you don't even find the, the, the... It is a matter of considerable anger that the company who lectured us on our lack of rigor in open source is the one who has refused to honor the GPL. Yeah. Um, so the, they developed this open risk, they took advantage of the entire work of the open source community, they lectured us on not being open source enough and then have not given their work back. So I think um, we can say they are an example of the worst abuses of the capitalist system. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's due to the LGBL license. That's the moderate and restrained version. Um, <laughs> so? that, that's the LGBL license, yeah, uh, that's part of the game. Is it all LGBL? LGBL, it's LGBL. So, yeah, so um, and Na NASA has, ob I mean, NASA usually sticks to these things, so I'm surprised NASA actually hasn't made this stuff properly. They're running Linux on it though. But all, all the software stuff's open, it's the RTL which they haven't released. So I wrote the RTL for that, and um, yeah, it's different to what's out in the open. You and mean for use the Apero uh, license? The what? It's a ferro license, okay. like when you can yeah, connect yeah. to the spacecraft with an antenna and you <laughs> have to or be able to... It's the version it's of GPL for web-based applications. Ah, uh, okay. Um, anyway, yeah, then if they were abiding by the letter of the license, they... And the spirit. They've sold... Which they lectured us on the spirit. I'm pretty sure they've sold products with it, so... It's pretty easy to stick to the letter of the GPL if you don't ship anything. But they have. They have. So. Well, space. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm curious now if it worked. <laughs> so what I, what I found is that they changed it to make it fault tolerant. But that's the only information. You don't have a, you don't know what well, it was used for. I changed it to make it fault tolerant. You, you did? Yeah, so Julius <laughs> didn't work. So, <laughs> okay. but I, I mean, I think if you have a commercial interest, it will be worth approaching NASA which has, under US law, obligations on openness to say that you wish to see the Verilog of TechEdSat, which was licensed on an open source license, or get a US friend of yours. Have we got any US nationals here? Yeah, well, um, to, to actually request that, because I, I suspect NASA would then have to comply. But um, that would be very good. NASA isn't very open right now. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, you have to wait a few weeks until they open back up. But when they do it, <laughs> That's true. I'm not sure that they have to, and especially as there was another company, there might have been some contractual stuff where. But I think you can go to if you go to NASA and say this was licensed under LGPL, under the LGPL. They will say LGPL. You do what you want from it. No, LGPL requires you. LGPL is non-viral, but it is still copyleft. Okay, LGPL is quite a strong license. 
So they are obligated to, sh to give to the customer, if the customer so requests, yeah. the source code. Now, the rules under the US, as I understand it, are that NASA, when it spends public money, has to make that stuff open. You don't have these things, David. No, I don't know about that. that really right. the, um, but I'm happy uh, to write a letter because I'm synthesizing full tolerance. Is it only to the customer? It's only the GPL is only an obligation to the person. When you give a binary, you must give the source. But it's because it NASA the is the customer. customer. So you have to get NASA. <coughs> but NASA also has an obligation under US law. When uh, the, the, it's the open publication stuff that comes with yeah, or, you know, or you have government funded research in this country and in the US has to now be public, published publicly and it did at the date that was done. So I suspect if you go to NASA and say this was a public education thing, it was funded out of the public, please because yeah, that, it that's strange because it was tech ed, so educational and technology satellite yeah. and yeah. at the end uh, you, you have even less information than a standard uh, satellite. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the goal to, to finish on this topic was to evaluate yes. what the company developed. They call it space plug and play avionics. I don't know really what it is. And they tried some um, <coughs> satellites to another constellation. So, Orcom and Iridium. These are two um, constellations where you can send uh, data. So, there was an intern satellite uh, communication uh, test. So, here, you might be better than me, and maybe I, I forgot something, so I could start to make it more complete. So, I've tried to list what are the main strengths of open risk. First, open source, so what, what it brings to the, to the users and the developer is first the flexibility, you do whatever you want. As we see uh, this week, everybody has an idea and can, can do it. That's it. And also, what is important for space and uh, defense application is the verification capabilities. As you provide the source code, there is no backdoor or all these stories that you heard in, under this day when you, you buy a, I don't know, a, a Chinese router, and then two years later you discover that inside the code there was something that was sending back all the data. With this, you cannot have such issue so it might help on the trust because we are having today a lot of issue with trust in the digital society so that's a good step for changing this second point is community driven it's really fun I'm not so much in the community it's the first time I'm coming here but I'm following from far the discussions and trying to understand what I can so this is good everybody can join and and, take, and tell what he wants and ask, and so that's really a good point. The low footprint, and that's true. So it's, it's not a big, uh, a big curve, it doesn't take too much uh, inside the, mm -hmm. the chipset. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah? You're right. Okay, <laughs> thank you. After, so this, uh, the architecture itself, there is no uh, Fancy things, it's really something standard that most of uh, CPU engineers would understand. So that's good for the, for the entry barrier, I would say, for the technological entry barrier. After, there is no vendor locking, so you don't have to license or... But there is no, not something hidden behind, from what I know today. And uh, what it brings to business is, uh, at the end, a reduced cost of ownership because you develop a new technology and you don't have to pay uh, 100,000 euros per year or per month because uh, you use a small IP core. So that's uh, really something which is uh, a big strength. So here, maybe you, Julius, you will be able to, <laughs> to talk uh, better than I, because uh, I searched on the internet, I found your master thesis, I think, and you, you had at that time, it was 2011, yeah. and you, you did some critical an analysis. So here is what I found. Maybe today it's no more true, because it's two years ago. No, it's still not true. So <laughs> here what, what I found, you, you explained that you could not run 16 bits application uh, instructions yeah. on the circuit. The instruction set is all 32 bit words, and so the code density is poor compared to you know hybrid 16 bit, 32 bit 
which is why we have the discussion on our 2K, which is at 11:30. Uh, <laughs> yep. So as time. So now, for now, we have a discussion on that. So this thing, so code density problems, we, we hope to address it in the next uh, session. Okay. Actually, yeah. Well, in the next architecture, which we'll discuss. In the next so that's that's part of the of the well, evolution. That's a downfall because yeah. you pay money for the co the area that area of memory that holds your code that you're running, and so you know if you can pay less for the amount of area that holds your code, or you can get more code in the amount of area. Or you use less power. Yeah, yeah, you use less power, less power fetching. Is the total footprint of CPU and memory is all important in space because uh, the larger the chip, the higher the risk of substrate vaporization due to meteorites. Well, sure. I thought they had plenty of space. <laughs> and I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, is, is Stefan's work help you with the interprocess communications instructions? I think. Yeah, I think in order to k they should be right in the instruction set, but mm -hmm. there, there's some the hot fixes we do okay. There's talk of extending OR1k though. So I mean we have a good versioning system now of the ISA, so we can just add it on and I mean there have historically been sixteen bit versions of OR1k. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you can go and look through the code base, and certainly on Orcs it has a sixteen bit simulation yes. in there. And yeah, uh, yeah, people, people did try and do an OR sixteen. Yeah, uh, but that was ten years ago. Yeah, if you look at the old mailing lists, there is one guy working on on a yeah. sixteen bit. But that would have been, I think, pure sixteen. That was just a sixteen bit architecture. So people have messed around. The actual architectural specification doesn't talk about it. it it's a two strokes. Um, uh, what do you mean by the reduced power management? Oh. So as I was explaining a bit too, so I inspired myself from Google. Oh, oh. And he explained that there was no dedicated flag that can go back to the operating system to better manage the context switch or I don't know. Uh, you remember? Oh yeah. The, this? There, there was something. The, there was something about uh, this. You can have sets of shadow registers, I believe, and the ISA. I oh, know this was an observation Jan Vernier made that. The ISA or the, the architecture spec has a shortcoming with regards to indicating the context you were in at the time of exception, and so if you have all these shadow registers, um, or you know, set of general purpose registers per context you're in, then there's, there's a bug there and that doesn't quite work properly. He tried to implement and came across this shortcoming. Yeah. So. Still, still today, but that's, that's not a big problem, but it's just ah, yeah, better. If you want to have these, what are they called? What are they? If you have, you know, two sets of GPRs. They're not shadow registers, or? Yeah. Yeah, they're called the open texts. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, different contexts. Anyway, yeah, uh, that's still the case. I don't think we can use them. Yeah, I think it's called fast context switching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But the, the power management thing is interesting. So a lot of the power management stuff that's in the spec, or at least was in the OR 1200, was ASIC specific and it wasn't very, you know, it was pretty old school, it was just like scaling the, um, scaling the clock frequency and that was it. There isn't much clock gating or anything like that. Okay. The first, uh, this might be a bigger problem. It seems that the, the, the casting from float to integer is not well defined or well defined. was not known exactly how it was working at that time. Yeah. You just define it though, don't you? you? Just go, this is how it is and software can deal with it, I guess. And the uh, last uh, remark that you found was the uh, arithmetic flat, where you, you could have some uh, undetected uh, overflow when you were divided or multiplying, something yeah. like that. It's far away, two years ago. There's a divide by zero, I think. I think by Ruben or something? Yes. We updated the spec with a few other things mm -hmm. recently. Yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, that's why maybe it's not updated. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's outdated. We're, so we're running slightly past time. Um, we've, got, we've lost your slides. Oh. The, I need to go fast. <laughs> Yeah. So, 
Then, early space SOC. Uh, so what is it? Uh, that's uh, an open, open source space communication system, uh, which is based uh, the reference organism is called CCSDS. These are groups of experts from all uh, national agencies and so on, NASA, ISA, CNES, uh, all, the, all the agencies of the world that comes and say, okay, based on previous missions, you, you need to use this modulation, you need to, to, to have this kind of coding in your, in your data, so you are, it's easy to, to receive them on Earth. And uh, the goal is to provide flexibility, as I explained to you, that's a, a big deal uh, for the spa long space mission, and also making it easier to upgrade by using what they call, maybe you heard about it, software defined radio. So, basically, in your phone today, you have chipsets where uh, you make uh, down conversion, you, you change the frequency when you receive it from 900 megahertz, you change it, you filter, you amplify, and so on. And the target of software defined radio is to make all this in software. So, you have mathematical functions. And you, you try really to, to get the signal close to the antenna, to have it really raw, and after you process it, and then it's easier to, to change the standard or whatever. For example, if the mobile phone were really software-defined radio, you could, with the same uh, phone, upgrade to 4G, for example, if, if it was properly, properly planned. <coughs> That's not the case today. So here, a uh, quick overview. So it's uh, a system on chip. There are six main uh, functions. So first one is the system management functions, I would say, which is common to all system on chips. So one which is to control and, and so on. So I put here the keyboard and the, the GPI. One function would be to test, to make sure that the, the system is working. So I put what uh, pseudo random Gaussian number, so you, you can put some basic data and see what is going out. And after monitoring, so it could be probes or also the screen or whatever. After there is uh, in telecom, but I, I think everywhere, the clock management is a big, big uh, topic because if you want to be flexible, changing your data rate, I want to pass from 10 to uh, 20 megahertz, it's easier to change your, your clock than you don't change anything in your, in your HDL or whatever. So I don't know if some people here know about uh, at ATPL. So it's all digital phase local loops. Yes. So this I saw that it was done in ASICS. But I'm not sure that it's working in FPGA. Well, you need a... Uh, uh, typically, this NDPLL, you have uh, 100 megahertz, and you say I want uh, 89 at the output. Yeah, so a DPLL, by definition, is entirely digital. It should work in any digital logic firmly. Yeah, there are reconfigurable, uh, reconfigurable uh, PLLs in FPGAs. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah, inside the, the FPGA. Yeah. But then, then you are locked to a... Uh, Xilinx or Altera uh, PLA, and it's not it's not uh, something that you control yourself, and you know how it's working. But a DPLL doesn't require any special analog circuitry, no BCM. DPLL, yes. Th that's why I put a DPLL because it's all digital. The DPLLs that were done that are on the market today are mixing a bit of analogic. There are still a bit of. Uh, so it's not. Uh, depends what your definition of a DPLL is. Then. <laughs> well, you don't need, need a higher frequency clock signal if you want it to do all digital. You certainly need a higher frequency clock signal. Your output jitter will be quantized by the resolution of your higher frequency clock. And you can use both edges of that if you're smart. But maybe we can, uh, we can talk a bit. Sure. If you know some, uh, a bit about I've worked on this, this uh, I would be interested. And after distribution, so dispatching the clock, the proper clock output to the, to the right module. After one point, which is on the power management, changing your voltage and distribution. Maybe to reduce the power consumption, that could be something that could be interesting, that you don't distribute the power to the unit part of the system on chip when it's not used. 
And here, uh, so this, uh, these two things are based on, uh, on DASA recommendation. So they, for the space telecommunication radio system, they advise people to, to you have a general processing module and a dedicated signal processing module. So here, the idea is to have uh, failure tolerance, not by changing openness, if we can have failure tolerance inside it's good, but by combining one open risk with another core, which is the Leon core that you might know also because it's open source also, and it's uh, space qualified. So that's also a good point to push open risk in the space competition because if if this is not flight proven for years, it's hard. This the Leon, you find it everywhere. So that's a kind of insurance that something might work at the end. Here some storage stuff, and here so that's. Typically, the telecom part. So, uh, having some kind of accelerator, so that was a question also. Do you know uh, some open DSP core or open GPU? Something that can maybe compute FFT really fast, or because in telecom there is a lot of signal processing. How about the other peer? Yeah. Okay. You're talking about putting all this on a single FPGA or ASIC or something, right? You need the RTL code for whatever you're talking about here. Yeah. So Epiphany don't really sell right there. I continue, and here, so you, you store your, your stuff, and you, you generate from bits, you generate uh, samples that you will put through the digital to analog converters, and after you have the amplification and the frequency change, and so on. And here it's for the interconnection because there, there will be the digital car, the analog car, and the samples, and how to, to get the data. I lost it, sorry. What are we doing? <coughs> so, yes, so the open point. Uh, so, this dual co processor configuration, it's not a multi core in the sense you were presenting, it's really multi-core in the sense of one phase, the other is, is still there. So it's a way of who is the boss. That's uh, always the question when you have high availability system. When there are two, it's hard. When there are three, it's easy. Because most of the time, if there are three, they can talk and say, okay, this guy, we are agreeing, and this other, okay, he's dead. But when there are two, there is a need for what they call fencing device which takes, make sure that uh, there won't be both that would work at the same time. So here, we already talked about it. Here, if you know some open source DSP or graphical processing unit, I would be interested. And here, um, that's me that doesn't know really how it's working, but this is, I would say, typical how to monitor the proper functioning of the system on chip. And to conclude, so uh, OBS Telecom has chosen uh, open risk as part of the key technologies for all the reasons and many others. The system on chip design is under finishing, and the target is to uh, put this in a real uh, space program. So you have really a dedicated application. So you keep the genericity to have it uh, compatible with different kind of scenario, but you have an application to, to qualify. So I would be happy to answer any questions and hear any remarks from you. Thank you. Thank you.